We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Bill Cushenberry was among the most influential custom car designers and builders of the mid-20th century. Bill learned the art of metal shaping in his father's shop in Wichita, Kansas, but his dreams of building show cars took him to Monterey, California in 1957, where he opened a shop and began chopping and rebuilding factory cars into one-of-a-kind masterpieces like the El Matador. This car attracted a clientele seriously interested in show cars, and Bill built several that are legendary. But the car Cushenberry is best known for was called the Silhouette. With this first scratch-built custom car of its kind, Bill won the Tournament of Fame Award at the 1963 National Roadster Show in Oakland, California, and was thrust into the company of a small group of men who dominated the West Coast show car scene. After his success with the Silhouette, Bill designed and started building what would become his last custom car, the Silhouette II Space Coupe a one-of-a-kind, handmade aluminum body on a Corvair chassis with a bubble top. And since the car was so low to the ground, his original design had no doors. You simply stepped into it. Here's Bill working on the space coupe in his Monterey shop in 1963. No doors. Meanwhile, down in North Hollywood, George Barris's shop had more work than they could keep up with. George encouraged Cushenberry to relocate near him, and as soon as Bill moved, Barris sent over his latest commission. I got one thing to say about Cushenberry, which I call him Cushy. To me, he was the best customizer in our group. He was one of the best idea design guys, too. He was terrific. Bill was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. See how good Cushy was? Well, I, still got a I had him do all the fenders on our Batmobile. The car was all metal. I said, Cushy, I need help. I said, we got to get this thing done in three weeks. I'll be there, George. And he came down there, and he shaped those fenders out. Bill continued work on the space coupe between commissions from Barris, and he refurbished cars for Steve McQueen and Frank Sinatra and several owners of Mercedes 300 SLs the car that introduced gull wing doors, which clearly inspired Bill with a new design idea for the space coupe. Here he is in his North Hollywood shop in 1966 fashioning gull wing doors, although they don't hinge on top like the 350 SLs, but at the back of the bubble. Another Cushenberry innovation. Sadly, before Bill could finish the car, he had a falling out with his financiers and moved to another shop, thinking that once the dispute was over, he would get the space coupe back and finish it. That never happened, and the Silhouette 2 space coupe went missing for three decades, popping up in a few shops over the years, but ultimately lost to Bill forever. He passed away in December 1998. Months later, in May 1999, Carl Green, another car customizer, found the space coupe on a ranch in El Cajon, California, in terrible condition, having sat out in the elements for years. Carl hauled the much-abused car to Daryl Starbird's Rod and Custom Hall of Fame Museum in Oklahoma, where he patched it up enough to exhibit briefly, then stored it for several years until he moved it back to California in 2008. That's when I got involved. My name is Barry Gramillion. I began making a documentary about Carl Green's exciting enterprise to complete this historic car, and I financed the entire project. Willie Newman, a renowned aluminum body man from New Zealand, joined the team and great progress was made until the end of December 2008. Carl's health was failing and Willie left for Germany, so the completion of the space coupe was once again put on hold. We put the car into storage in Nebraska with Carl's nephew and my business partner, Roger Green, seen here with Gene Winfield and the Space Coupe. After Carl passed away in 2015, we retrieved the Space Coupe from storage and began the final phase of completing Bill Cushenberry's vision.
Bill Cushenberry and Daryl were friends in, in the very beginning of their careers back in Wichita, uh, Kansas, right? Right. I started my shop in 1954. I called it Star Custom Shop. Uh, Bill was a friend at that time. He hung around the shop a lot and always talked cars and we were yeah. friends in that uh -huh. relationship. Went lunch together occasionally and just friends, normal friends. Mm -hmm. And he got the bright idea of putting it in his own shop. Mm -hmm. And he called it Kansas uh, Custom Shop. Oh. And it was about eight or ten blocks from my shop. And he even stole a few of my customers. <laughs> <laughs> but he only lasted in that shop maybe a year, year and a half at the long. And uh, he built a few cars at that time. Not many because cars were at that era and that time I had started my shop up cars custom cars are practically unheard of in the yeah. Mid -Amer or hot rods. Yeah. People had hot, hot rods. rods, yeah, but not like these cars. Not 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 custom cars mm -hmm. as such. A few hot rods but not many. Uh, most of it was all taking place on the West Coast mm. in California. Barris was already in action. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Winfield was Winfield, already in. Uh -huh. See when I was in high school they were already in business. Oh, right. And they were my idols, so uh -huh. to speak, when I was yeah. in high school. I they were your inspiration. I wanted to grow up to be George Barrett. Oh, yeah. You know, and and so their, their cars were in the magazines. And right. you, you were and what, looking at the magazines. That's where I got it from, the magazines. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Bill, he built a car for himself, a 50 Oldsmobile. It was really well done and well, and for that period of time, it was really a radical car. And when he got to California, he started up his shop there in Monterey. Mm -hmm. Of course, him being close to me and, and related business-wise, he kind of spread the rumors that he was working Daryl Starber ah, to kind of get started. So that's where it started. That's where it all right. started. Okay. You know? But he never really worked for me mm -hmm. on a salary type basis. But Bill's a heck of a craftsman, and he, he was even then. He was a real good metal man. Bill and I, we were friends long after that. He come here to the museum. We inducted him uh, as one of the uh, original 13 guys. Right, we right. inducted into it. And he was here every year for it. And it was a great supporter. So here we are in Hollister, California, Don Varner. Don was a friend of Bill Cushenberry and worked with Bill for many years uh, on the silhouette, the original silhouette in the El Matador. In the El Matador, yeah. Why don't you tell us how, how, how you, you guys met and started working together? Well, one day I was at the Salinas drag strip and uh, this fellow walked up to my uh, pickup introduced himself as Bill Cushenberry and uh, said he'd just moved out from Kansas. He uh, wanted to build a 44 coupe and I think it was a 39 actually he started with. We used to go to a place called the Dog House. We'd sit over there and have coffee and and uh, do some sketches. And uh, On napkins. On napkins, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That's really where the car was was designed. The El Matador. Yeah, what Matador. became the El Matador? Right? At the time, I had a '58 Corvette, and if you look at the Matador, you'll see a lot of '58 Corvette in it. Each one of the fenders had a concave, so that's what started that theme. And then, if you notice on the trunk of the El Matador, there's two bars that come down. Yeah, what was and that? They roll underneath. Well, that's what was on a '58 Corvette on well, chrome. The chrome bars on the rear. We picked a lot of styling off of that and mm. uh, married it with the 40 Ford. Chopped it just right, I thought. I always love uh, headrests, so I talked him into those two headrests. Mm. I went in there. Uh -huh. He could uh, hammer weld right straight across a, a cut, say on the top one, we pieced mm. the, when he pieced those parts back together, and he could hammer weld that and not have any work. And he did it the, the hard way, the yeah. old hard way. And that was the first custom that he had done in in, in that shop, really anywhere. I mean, yeah. before, that was his yeah. first custom car. Right. And that put him on the map. Instantly famous. <laughs> he was. And then he was still wet. I mean, he won the big trophy and they sent him to Europe and all that. And where did that the, the idea come from on the silhouette? He had started that before I. I knew about it. The, the body was scratched oh, on, yeah. a Buick, on a Buick chassis. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. With a uh, conduit, mm -hmm. you know, for the basic frame. And right. then he put the metal. The super Ligera style. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like they did in Italy. Yeah, right. 
So he would already started the silhouette, yeah. and then you st then you guys got you. Yeah, we got our heads, heads together, together, and we decided that we needed to change the shape, especially on the side. It was a tricky car to build because that was the first plastic bubble he had ever blown, and it's the first one I ever had anything to do with. There were several cars that happened rapidly right after that. The, the Marquis, the Astro, the Dream Rod, a lot the of Limelighter, all yeah. those came kind of quickly. Bill's the finest metal man I've ever met, and he didn't have a lot of tools. Yeah. You know, he, he shaped Simplicity. everything by hand. Yeah. Hammers and torches and yeah, oh, uh, and lead. Yep, yeah, that's all we do use is is lead because we we hated Bondo. Bill seemed to have evolved, especially with the space coupe, which, like I said, he started in in um, in Monterey. But at first, it had no doors because it was so low to the ground that you just stepped into it. Right. Just recently, we found photographs that had never been seen before of Bill from 1966 of him working on uh, on, gull wing. on the on the space coupe with the goal and he was just oh, yeah. developing the gull wings and that was just before he lost the car this car will be world famous oh yeah Man, I've got to see this, you know. And I walk up and, and look in there, and here's the matter. And I said, Oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. It's just a, the, the whole car was just was blew me away. The paint job was like nothing I'd ever seen before, you know. And and, uh, and I was a painter myself anyway. I've been painting, started striping cars in the 50s, you know. And but when I seen that, it just blew me away. And, Cushionberry and all this. I never heard of Bill before, and you know, I got to go see him. So we went over into uh, Monterey and Seaside area and, and found his shop. And uh, there was a chain up there, Keep Out. And, and beautiful. There's Gene Boucher's uh, golden marquee, but it wasn't gold, and it was actually a blue pearl, and uh, it was very pretty. And uh, I never seen anything like that. It just blew me away. And he said, "Can I help you?" I said, "Well, no, I'm from Kansas." And he said, "Oh, what part of Kansas?" I said, "McPherson." He goes, "Oh, well, Mac Town." Huh? I says, "Yeah." I says, "I got a lot of friends in Mac." And we had a nice conversation, and I told him how much I loved the Matador and how great it was, and I was just excited over it. It really got me jazzed up about painting, you know, more than I was already. Ended up getting a job with him later on, so everything worked out fine. Through this friend of uh, mine, this George Ross, that I'd worked with at another body shop. He went to work at a place called Lance Incorporated, which was Bill's old shop that these guys were taking over Bill's business. And uh, Bill was phasing out of that business. But And I went in and painted a Mercedes-Benz uh, enamel job. And uh, Bill came in and uh, he really liked the work and he offered me a job, you know, if I ever need work, you know, and something don't work out here, just to, uh, to uh, give him a call. And so a few months later, I, I worked there about six months with George Ross. And, he was doing the Ford Custom Caravan stuff, and that Bill was supposed to have done, but Bill was out of the picture because he had opened up his new shop in Burbank, and where he was working on a, the KHJ Surfing Bird. Bill was just, he was really nice to me. He just really, and we just hit it off because we were both from Kansas boys, you know, and so I got to paint Frank Sinatra's car and uh, the silhouette. I painted it a couple times. Uh, we had to get it ready. In nine weeks, we had to have Sinatra's car done, and we had to have the silhouette painted and heading out for St. Louis, Missouri for the for the big show at the Keel Auditorium in St. Louis. It had been on the show circuit for quite a while. It had been set for a few years. He had had it leased out, and then he, he got it back and restored again. The first time I had seen this thing, uh, Bill was just, uh, he asked me, he said, have you seen my little uh, aluminum car? I says, uh, no, I haven't yet, but I heard somebody say something about it. It was in the back room, and I didn't want to go and no taller than this, you know. It, it's just beautiful and uh, all this aluminum work on it and these beautiful elliptical wheel wells uh, that was just done and all this uh, beautiful gas welding. I was so impressed with all of the, the metal work and everything and the bubble top. And, uh, it's just a very pretty car. This is in North Hollywood right where Vineland and Lancashire crisscross. Lance Incorporated, these uh, the two fellows from Boston that Bill partnered up with, but the partnership went sour, so that's when Bill left. And I'm not really sure of where the, the, the car actually started its 
construction, you know, but I knew it was it was pretty well on its way when I seen it. I think it just came from Monterey where this uh, Roden, uh, Roden, an artist, R-O-T, yeah, he had done a, I'd seen a sketch that he had done of the, of the car, and uh, he was from that area, I think. You know, it was a very interesting and exciting time in the United States and I guess the world because um, Kennedy announced they were going to go to the moon. Um, the Jetsons were on TV, were part of that uh, on TV. Uh, the little cars you would zip around on, <laughs> right. and the bubble tops uh, on the cars. So uh, your car was is one of those. I was in Monter in Salinas area and was close with Bill from 1962 to 1966. In the beginning, his shop was on uh, Del Monte Boulevard, uh, down from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. That's where the where the silhouette was built, the silhouette one. And I watched the construction of that car all the way through. I'd be, become acquainted with Bill at a car show in, in San Jose when he presented the Matador, mm -hmm. which was a 44 that he had chopped and sectioned and mm -hmm. done a lot of work on. These were drawn in, in 1962 or 63, 64. And it started with this delta with a with a uh, with a bubble, and as we talked about it more, the the idea of using a Corvair engine, you see, came into play because then we could keep have a chassis that was low, and the engine could be mounted uh, at a very very low uh, position within the chassis, which left uh, didn't interfere with developing this pointed nose on the front uh, like we wanted, showing how the bubble top might be done with the wing and the intake for the for the engine above. Again, mobile cars. And again, these are 50-year-old drawings. Uh, this is the evolution of the silhouette, that's too. That's correct. Another, um, now you see they're starting to get the, for the rear shape. But in, in your car, what we had in mind here, here, here was the, the, the front. And the bubble. The wheel was was tucked on way underneath here, you know. But the bubble itself, we hadn't uh, worked out any details with respect to uh, whether there should be a door cut on the side or whether the sill would be too high or too low to get in, whatever. And these intakes up here were to be oil coolers for the Corvair engine. So the car probably was started there and then when he moved down he brought it back up here and then he had been there for a year or so already so I'm I'm not aware of that time span what how much was done on the car. Lance moved in and they offered a partnership and gonna help bail him out of every money problems and stuff. That only lasted probably maybe eight six months to a year or something like that. When their business went sour that he just stopped working on it and they took possession of the car, and uh, he he just went ahead and and moved over to Burbank Bur Burbank Boulevard and opened up his shop over there, which where he uh, did the Batmobile and and the KC Surfing Bird and a few other cars. He didn't want anybody else finishing his car uh, without his input. You know, he loved the car. I mean, he, we always went and doodle on napkins and about different little things he had planned to do with it and all this, and he's always doodling like that still drawing up plans about things he'd like to do to it and stuff like that. But in 74, I moved from Ventura back to Bakersfield and opened up a shop on Buck Owens Boulevard there. I asked Bill if he wanted to come down and, uh, and work out of the shop. So we got a, uh, we were together a couple of years there and uh, he kind of gave up on customs completely for a while and just went into strictly just doing Porsches and stuff for a few years. We enjoyed everything about it. Because he, we, uh, to me, every car that he's done was the best. The workmanship was a craftsman, he was a quality man, and the best part, he was fun. The great fun guy. To me, uh, like I said, he was, again, the top of the, top of the heap. Yeah. A very, very good metal shaper and worker. Very particular. Um, odd hours, though. He liked to put in hours that midnight till six in the morning and things like that. And I just wasn't used to that. But I went along with him because I loved the guy. A lot of people don't know this. The Batmobile, when it was first started, 
was the Lincoln Futura. And it got sent over to Bill's shop with the artwork to start. I worked on uh, that aluminum car you were talking about. I worked on that with him. Uh, but I, I just couldn't get along with his hours. Yeah. His yeah. hours just, my wife didn't like it, you yeah. know, and I yeah. couldn't get used to it. And, but I went along with him because I loved the guy. I mean, he was just very nice to work with and easy. And That's it. I knew about Bill and I met him a couple of times at shows. Well then I never really got acquainted with him until we started doing the custom car caravan. The AMT, you know, thing where we traveled around the country and, and then I did a lot of shows with, with Bill. So I did a show with him in Florida and, and we went out on a boat. We went out and I went water skiing in Florida and I met Bill and his wife and that's where we really got acquainted and after that we were really good friends. Well, I'll start off with how I came acquainted with Bill and it all started actually with the marquee which is the 56 Ford that Bill radically customized uh, in his shop in Monterey. The car was built originally for Gene Boucher and uh, became a, a mild project, turned into a major project over the years and uh, evolved into a car being sectioned and parts being grafted on and sculpturing. It came out quite extremely radical. Gene showed the car for a year, a little over a year, and put the car away in the garage for many, many years. And I wound up acquiring the car. The only modification I did on the marquee was something that Bill had wanted to do, and that was to redo the rear wheel wells. Uh, he, he didn't like the way that they came out and wanted to revamp them and bring them down lower. So that was done in the process of the restoration of the, of the body and the body work. So finally the marquee was finished and uh, went on the sh uh, show circuit and did very well. Bill was very, very creative. He liked to build exotic, one-off, prototype cars. That's That was really where he, his heart was. If you look at some of the cars that he built, such as the Silhouette, the Marquis, these cars were really built for one person, and they were show cars. And that's the type of thing that Bill always strived to do, was to make something so unusual using his talents and exposing his capabilities of, of making something that people's, would, would draw people to the car and they would go around it and look at and find many, many little detail works. That was what Bill's design work was all about. Well, we've come here to Lompoc, California. This is Bruce Heather, who came down from Seattle for the show. Bruce is a old friend of Bill's. Tell us about when you first came in contact with Bill. Yeah, I first met Bill in March of 1963 in Seattle at the first Seattle Road Show. He had the, brought the silhouette there. He had the silhouette on the display. I was in the 10th grade, and it really something to see that car. Yeah, had you seen it in magazines? No. Oh, uh -uh. it had never been seen before? No, not yet. Mm. And I had seen the 44 that he worked on, a, a Bob Crespo car at the year before at the World's Fair car show. He had that car there. That was a feature car. Mm. Let a less popo. You were telling me about the conversation you had about the space coupe. Bud Millard and, and Bill Cushenberry and myself were sitting at a picnic bench at a uh, table in Paso Robles in 1998, just six months before he passed away. He uh, was talking about that car and he wished that he could find it, but he had no clue what happened to it. And, and he, you know, he'd talk about it often. He really wanted to find it. 
Yeah, isn't it interesting that just about a year exactly after that conversation is when it was found in terrible condition in May, May 1st of, uh, it would have been 1999, so it was a year after you uh, they yes. had that conversation. When we found it, the owner of this ranch was about to, Bob Butts, was about to send it off to be crushed. We salvaged it. Just before we go, the space coop was here when Carl first found it, he brought it out here, right. and you helped him patch it together. Yeah. No restoration, right, no. Did, just patched it together enough, and it, and it was in your museum, sat in oh, yeah. the museum for a couple of years, right? Yeah. Before he brought it back yeah. to California right. when it, exactly. when I got it. We probably there. had it about five years total, yeah. I would guess, something like that. Put a little bubble top, top on it. Yeah, it fit quite nicely. Did you know about the space coupe when Bill was working on it? Bill told me about the car uh -huh. numerous times. Yeah, every time he's here, we'd talk about it. I thought he was going to finish it. Yeah. You know? Sure, he did too. Anyway, it went south, yeah. and he walked away from the car. And, and he mentioned it that last interview that he did here at your uh, place in 1997. Uh, they asked him, "Did you do any other cars?" And he said, "Yeah, well, there was this one that got away, and it was it was going to be a wild thing with gold wings and a bolt top." And he described, and he was talking mm -hmm. about the space coupe. He never mentioned the name. The silhouette was this one solid bubble that hinged, oh, yeah. that hinged at the front. The space coupe started out that way. Um, Jim Roten told us that they, it, originally it was going to have no doors. It was just low enough to the ground you just, just step, step in, in. And it was a solid bubble that hinged from the front, just like the silhouette. And we have pictures from 1963 of Bill working on this car in that configuration. No doors, solid bubble in 63 in a shop in Monterey. However, when he moved down to North Hollywood, one of the jobs that came into his shop were these Mercedes 300 SL, the, oh, the famous gull wing doors. Gold. Bill obviously fell in love with these gull wing doors. So, Presto, gull wing doors. I'm calling them bat wings now because gull wings open like this. Yeah, right. These open like this. I'll be you know how bats wings, they, oh, you know, they okay. come from the shoulders up like this. So oh, I don't know if bat wings works, but I, they're not gold wings, yeah. you know, so I don't know, I can't... Bat wing sounds good to me. Yeah, exactly. The interest is peak the moment you see it. Actually, my partner is the one who located it. I think I was reached in a phone call by someone, someone up uh, in Northern California or Central California. It could have been Bakersfield. And Jack went up with a, um, with a trailer, looked at it, he phoned, he was just foaming at the mouth, but it was... Uh, uh, so neat. He says, if we've got to get this. Says, you won't believe this car. It's one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. He was just knocked out by it. And when he brought it to the shop, it was just astounding. What is this? It's a flying saucer? It's, <laughs> it's a bird? It's a plane? It's a supercar? <laughs> one time uh, you, you told me about after Bill lost the car, walked away from the car, that you okay. saw it on the street or somewhere? I or saw it at a, at a body shop, and I recognized it, and and then uh, <clears throat> I called up Bill and, and told him it was there, and, and I said, I want to buy it. And he got mad. He didn't want me to buy it, because he didn't want it to be a Gene Winfield car, and I wouldn't have done that anyway. I would have, you know, definitely had it uh, originally built by Bill Cushenberry. Do you remember where it was, what shop it was in? No, yeah. it was in North Hollywood, but I don't remember. I was just driving. It wasn't his old shop that no, he had no, left. No, no, it's after he lost it. Right. Yeah, and then, and then I didn't know that it was at, uh, at Bob Butts' place. Yeah. I didn't know it was there. I would have bought it. Yeah, nobody knew until yeah. it was found. Sitting there in the weeds.